It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Belinda Lowe Mackey. She created the uh, Drevy Zebra Trust. Uh, WCN sent me to visit uh, Belinda this past summer on uh, help, her with, help her out with some technical issues. I had the pleasure of seeing the Grevy zebras, and it's, it's one incredible zebra. This is not the plain zebra. And, uh, well, there's something really interesting going on with Grevy zebras, and I, I hope you'll uh, pay attention to what Belinda has to say. It's fascinating. Belinda? Good morning, everyone. It's really fantastic to be here um, and to see a lot of familiar faces and, and some new faces. Um, and thank you so much for coming, um, and we're really excited to share um, our work on the Grevy Zebra with you. Um, the Grevy Zebra is one of Africa's most endangered large mammals. It faces serious threats, uh, including habitat loss, uh, limited access to water, and poaching. And if we don't address these threats, we risk uh, to stand, we stand to risk losing Grevy Zebra in the wild. And we believe uh, that by engaging local communities and empowering them is the most effective way to conserve the species. And today we ask you um, to listen to our innovative work and to consider joining us in our efforts to save this magnificent animal. And not just for um, our own benefit, but obviously for that of future generations. I want you just to take a moment to look at this magnificent species. Notice the fine, intricate stripe pattern, that soft brown nose, and those wonderful, intelligent eyes, and of course, those huge, fuzzy ears. My love affair with Grevy Zebra began 13 years ago. I was really lucky to be born and raised in Kenya, um, and I had a very strong connection to wildlife at a very young age, and I think that's something we all share in this room. When I came back to home to Kenya, um, the first job I got was studying the zebras, and uh, I, that's when I realized how endangered they were, and I got curious about what was going on in the larger part of their range. And that's when um, I realized that people were really the key to the future survival of this species. In the 1970s, uh, there were 15,000 Grevy zebra, and today that number is just over 2,500. If we look at their distribution, uh, you can see that the black area is their current range, um, and it's predominantly in Kenya, in East Africa. And the gray shaded area is where they used to um, exist. And so their range has shrunk dramatically over the last 40 years. Um, and those, that area is very arid, so they're uniquely adapted to survive in these, in these harsh, arid climates. And this is in contrast to the plain zebra. So the plain zebra occupy higher rainfall habitats, um, and there is a small area of overlap between the range of the two species, and I just wanted to show you this photo. You can see on the right-hand side are the Grevy zebra. Um, and on the left, the plains. And the grevies are much taller. They've got those fine, narrow stripes um, and those beautiful white bellies and, of course, the ears. Today, I'm going to talk about three major threats. Um, the first is loss of habitat, and that is the loss of plant cover in the landscape. Um, and it's not just an environmental issue. Uh, but also a social one, because the local communities living in Grevy Zebra um, range also depend uh, on those same resources because their livestock need to eat the same grasses. The second threat is limited access to water. So, as I said, their range is very dry um, and uh, water is very precious in those areas. And so, what happens is, during the dry season, there's a lot of pressure on the existing water sources. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and so, uh, during the dry season, sometimes uh, livestock come to occupy the water for 24 hours. So, um, that means that when the Grevy zebra come at night, they actually get excluded from these water sources. And the third threat is poaching. 
And we've realized uh, in working the one, in the one area where poaching is taking place that this is not just about uh, a bushmeat kind of law enforcement issue, but it's also exacerbated by conflict with communities. Um, and so Peter is going to be talking about how we're addressing this through peace building. Today, uh, we want to touch on three major strategies that we're using to address these threats. Um, and the first one is community engagement. So, you know, it's basically uh, really involving communities in what we do so that they own everything that we're doing, um, because that will make our work more sustainable in the long term. The second one is how we're addressing habitat loss and how we're working with communities to plan their grazing so that overgrazing does not occur uh, in the landscape. And the third one uh, is about using peace building as an, as a, an approach to um, addressing the, the threat of poaching. We work in an area that's almost uh, twice the size of Delaware State. So it's a big area, um, and we have an amazing team on the ground. And we work in three different regions within that area. Um, and we've tailored our conservation programs um, specifically to suit the uh, context uh, of the area because the threats are slightly different in each region. So uh, we have scouts um, who monitor the Grevy zebra. And predominantly, we employ women in this program. And they collect data and have done for many years. And we have a very good data set from this. We also have Grevy Zebra ambassadors, um, and they are trained in law enforcement, um, and they are our anti-poaching team. And then the third category is our Grevy Zebra warriors, and they're a fantastic team. Um, and they are our eyes and ears on the ground, and they work in a very arid area. And so they're always constantly monitoring the zebras and checking um, when we might need to do interventions, such as um, water management. Um, or in some cases, supplementary feeding. And um, they have created a very strong network uh, of outreach among their co, co work uh, not workers, but among that demographic of warriors. One of the things that um, these teams do is uh, they have, because they, their job is Grevy Zebra, they've developed a very strong emotional connection uh, to the zebras, and I just wanted to share this story briefly uh, of Patton here. She's one of our scouts. One day she was walking uh, on her patrol and she found this grevy zebra foal, and she wondered where the mother was. She tried to trace the mother, um, and she couldn't um, find, find her. So she waited all day, and she waited at a distance so as not to disturb the foal, and she was worried, you know, she didn't want to disturb the mother when the mother came back. Anyway, the mother didn't return. Um, and Patton was getting increasingly worried about what might happen um, you know, to this foal because there are a lot of hyenas in the area. Um, and so she talked to her community and said, look, I really want to bring this foal into the homestead uh, tonight. And so they, even though it was against their culture to bring wild animals into the home, uh, they said, OK, let's do it. Yeah. And so the next morning, um, we came to pick the foal up to take it to an orphanage. Um, and the whole community was there. The kids would, would buy the Grevy Zebra side. They wouldn't leave it, and the elders were watching. And um, they said to us, can you please name this foal Salango after our village? And so we said, yeah, sure. And so the foal was taken to an orphanage. And I'm really sorry to tell you that it didn't work out well. Um, didn't survive because it was so young. Um, and, you know, but I just wanted to tell that story because it's, it's a lovely story of how connected um, and emotionally attached our teams get to the zebras. And what we try to really do is ensure that the wider community is supporting these teams as well. And we do that through community outreach workshops. Uh, that's Peter in the middle there, surrounded by some lovely ladies. Um, and what we do is we have, um, we've sort of changed our approach this year and find it very effective. We have, um, workshops with different groups. So on one day we, we have women, another day we'll have the warriors, and the next day we'll have the elders. And um, then the fourth day we'll have uh, representatives from each group. And what they do is form a community action plan. 
Um, and through that community action plan, they are planning to do, uh, to be better stewards of their environment, <coughs> including um, habitat restoration um, and also um, water management. Um, and this is one of the um, results you know, of this uh, community action plan that we have. Um, and what's great is that it's driven by the communities themselves. And we follow up with them, but we don't provide them with any financial support. We just provide technical support. Uh, we provide them with uh, technical support. Um, and that way, they're able to implement what they want to do, but the, it's their own plan. Um, this, is, this year, we've had a terrible drought. Um, and one population of Grevy zebra, we actually had to uh, start feeding um, because they had lost a lot of condition. Um, and so, you know, this is a short-term response, and ideally we don't want to do that. We want to create stability in the landscape. Um, and, you know, so in the long term what we're doing is looking at restoring uh, habitat with communities. Now, you're probably wondering, you know, why I've got a picture of torrential rain here, but I wanted to show you that when it rains, actually all this water runs off um, and so what happens is we're losing um, about 80% of the rainfall because it runs off this very hard cap soil and doesn't soak in. Um, and so what we need to do is change the conditions of the soil so that uh, we can break it up. And when it does rain, we actually capture that rainfall. And the way we do this is using the hooves of the animals. We have abundant livestock in the landscape. Um, and so we want to uh, work with communities so that when they are grazing their animals, they actually can bunch them together. And effectively, they can till the land and break that soil up. Um, and it's incredibly effective. Uh, it's an incredibly effective tool. Um, and they can also use um, you know, overnight bomas where the, where the cattle sleep to treat really bare areas as well. Um, the other approach that we use is clearing unwanted brush um, and then planting indigenous grass seed um, in those areas. Um, and that's uh, also a very uh, great way of creating a you know, plant response quickly. And I want to show you the results of this. So if you look at um, that tree with the, around the red circle, that's the same bush uh, in both photos. And so the top photo is where we have done uh, clearing and reseeding, um, and then at the same time have had a grazing plan around that area. So to allow for recovery time, but also using the livestock to break up that soil. Um, it's really important for us to be able to scale this approach up because it's a very widespread issue, um, and it's a social issue, not just an environmental one. Um, and so. Uh, we're fortunate to be partnered with the Northern Rangelands Trust, which is an umbrella institution for the community conservancies where we work, uh, who have been able to um, implement uh, on a wider scale the same approach. And we're really excited because Westgate Community Conservancy, where we first started this approach, um, has, is building a training center for other communities to come and learn how to do this. Um, so it's now my pleasure to invite Peter who is our field director up here. Um, Peter is an amazing man. He is um, an incredible diplomat with communities. He's got a real gift. Um, and last year, he won the Disney uh, Hero Award. So he's one of our major conservation heroes in Kenya. So thank you, Bill. Uh, and, uh you know, thank you for sharing with us all that uh, important work that uh, has been started. And um, yeah, I know some of you are wondering, um, who is this guy in different kind of dressing? And why is he here in the first place in California? Um, absolutely, I just want to share that, uh, you know, I got into conservation, uh, I think when I was still a young toddler, that's what I would say. Because, uh, you know, I happen to be born and brought up in Samburu, the same area where Grave Zebra Trust is doing its work. And uh, I had the opportunity, you know, as a pastoral kid to go out and herd livestock. And that created a connection between me and the wildlife. Because as I was doing the herding, 
my best companions were the zebras, were the elephants, the lions. Some of you might say, how do you hide in the presence of the lions? We all were coexisting in the same ecosystem as a pastoral kid. And that in itself connected me to the environment. That in itself made me realize that we are one and the same thing with our environment. And so when I went to the university, when I went to the school, I thought, well, do I want to make money or do I want to make a difference? I said, I want to make a difference. And so I chose a career to go into conservation because that's where I thought I would make a difference. That's where I thought I would give back to my community. And so I stand today to, to, to tell you about this community where we're working, but also sometime, you know, in some of these areas where we work, you'll wonder, yes, it's such a paradise. If you look at this picture, some of you might wonder, why am I sharing, showing a picture of the plain zebra together with the grave zebra? This picture tells you something. And what it tells us is that in some of these areas where we are working, there is great potential. We have enough pasture, we have water, but my colleagues, my companions, the wildlife, are going down each day in numbers. The question is, why are they going down? That's the first question some of you might ask me. Why are the numbers going down? Absolutely, there are a number of things that are happening in this landscape. And one of them is that in these areas where we're working, communities that have been fighting historically, using the spears and bows and also, you know, because of the livestock, they have become more sophisticated in their fights. And as you can see in that picture, these are men who have armed themselves. They have armed themselves because of insecurity in this area. And one thing I want to say in these areas where we're working is that, uh, you know, as people arm themselves, battle after battle, people sleeping out in the bush, children crying, hungry, thirsty. And you wonder, why? Why, do, why is it this, all this is happening? Absolutely, it's not just affecting the people. It's also affecting the wildlife that coexists in the same environment. And as they do this, it's affecting everything that we do. Some of these areas, the area that I just shown you before, is called Alberta, with all the amazing resources. But we were worried because besides the fact that we had the unpushing team, the communities are fighting each day, they are losing their life, but we are also losing wildlife as they go out trades. They use wildlife as a delicacy, you know, as they go th for their raids. And so we said, we've invested a lot of resources by employing the anti-pushing team. We've invested a lot of resources in terms of, you know, educating some kids in the same area. We've invested a lot of resources in building our base area in the same area. But, you know, beside all that, we are worried. We are losing all the investment we made. And so we said, we need to be pragmatic. We need to be innovative in the way we resolve this conflict. And so we started the Alberta Conservation Council, similar to the traditional system where the elders used to resolve conflict. But in this one, it's a bit different because they are elders as well as they are warriors. Because when we talk with these elders, they tell us we don't go for war. We are not the one causing the fights. It's the warriors who cause the fight. So how do we bring them on the table? We made them part of the conservation team. And this was the first time when I took them out for a training in one of the conservancies. And they were like, man, we are not sure we'll, go, we'll do this. We are not sure we'll change this because it's bigger than us. But I told them, yes, you will do it. And after this training, we gave them the skills to do conflict resolution. We gave them the tools to be able to go and face out their communities. And after the training, they were so enthusiastic. They were so passionate to go out and engage their communities. The first thing they did is they went as different tribes. The Samburus went to the Samburus. The Trukanas went to the Trukanas, engaged them in their respective villages. And they said, yes, 
We are tired of the war. We are tired of our fight. But where do we start? They said, we are not sure we will come in the same table and talk. We are worried about coming together and sitting down and talking. And we say that as Grave Zebra Trust, we will give you a platform. And the platform is, Gravis will bring you together to sit down and talk with your friends. And seeing them, their first meeting, the first meeting when they came together and sat down, I just made one move. Decided to sit back and observe what they will do. The first reaction I saw were people who could not trust one another. The first reaction I saw were people who had fear in themselves. But some of them made the first move. One of them, a young man, decided to talk one of the, to one of the colleagues from the other side and told him, I think I know you. And I said, yeah, you know me. I'm so-and-so. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. We met that time. They started engaging and talking. Through that, they built a trust. Through that, they were able to, you know, laughter just happened from nowhere. They were able now to start engaging and talking about their first stories. And all the rumor that was there about an impending uh, attack, the attack that was going to happen, was resolved because of this meeting. These are success stories that we see when we bring this community. And one of them actually said in that meeting, I couldn't imagine Gravis could bring in peace. So I told him, go out to the village, say Gravis for peace. Because we need this peace. We don't need you to fight. We want you guys to have peace because that will bring in coexistence. But as we do that, it's not just about the elders. It's not just about the warriors. We also think about the young generation. These are the people who will become the next elders. These are the people who will become, you know, the next team of conservationists. So we reach out to the young generation, and this is just one example of uh, an outreach program that we do in the schools. We go to the young kids, talk to them, and also bring you know, make their voices to be heard. Because they go back and share these stories to their parents. But as we do that, we also give some of them an opportunity. They are, some of them come from very poor background. They don't make uh, to go to school. And so we give scholarship to some of these young kids. And one of them, I just want to quote one of them, who was one of our scholars. And he said, Grave Zebra, what a beautiful animal you are. It's because of you that I am where I am. May you exist in nature to eternity. That was a powerful statement from our, one of our scholarship recipients, Michael Adan. He always remained my role model because when he goes to the community, he shares with his community how he made from a poor background to the university where he's studying now. So these are success stories. But our biggest dream is peace, coexistence, between the pastoral communities, wildlife, and the people. Because this is where our success will rely. If people will have peace, then wildlife will have peace. If people will have peace, then they will think about the health of their land. And this is our big dream. And we can't achieve this dream without all of you. So we we'll always want to say thank you when we get an opportunity to each one of you, but also to the institutions that makes us you know, do what we do. We know institutions are made of people. They are made of individuals. And these institutions have made us be what we are today as a Grave Zebra Trust. I really want to recognize and really thank St. Louis Zoo because they were the co-founders of Grave Zebra Trust. They were the first people who held our hand and told us you can be able to do what we are doing. But I also want to recognize and thank, you know, Wildlife Conservation Network. They have made us what we have today, bring all of you today in order for us, those who are working in the field, to have a chance to say thank you to each one of you. And I say that as I do that, I really want to say that we are just so excited because in two weeks' time, we have a groundbreaking activity, you know, to build our camp in Westgate, one of these areas where we are, you know, where, where we are doing the habitat restoration work. So, 
As I say that, I really want to say thank you. And as we do the habitat restoration, as we, as we do the community outreach, as, as we do the posting, uh, working on peace, we believe all this will lead to grave you know, sustainability in their natural range. I really welcome all of you and thank you because we have achieved a momentum so far and we really need support you know, from you to Grave Zebra Trust to make sure that we achieve what we are doing. And as I say that, I really want to say thank you and uh, welcome you to Samburu whenever you get a chance to come and see the wonderful work we are doing. Thank you.